flat-roofed pubs on the corners of estates, he clutches his carrier with pride. They have the lyrics on the screen, but this man is analogue, typed up, stacked neatly, and then dispatched into plastic. He winces as he watches young romantics, cavorting and dancing at angles, nursing half a theakstons until the karaoke resumes, his sun star, spotlight. His voice is gravelly nowadays with a croak as he pushes his range, but 20 years previous this guy was a different class. Eyes scrunched, he serenades for lovers who escaped as the young romantics fumble through the food of distant dreams, dumb to what they're missing and how precious these moments are. His three minutes flash, he picks up his bag and then he shovels to his stool at the bar. Glen Campbell, Johnny Walker, Tom Jones, and then bed. Old lungs, young lovers, every Friday from eight. My name is Matt Abbott, welcome to this week's Insta session. This is number 28. Um, so we've been running these sessions pretty much every week since the start of May. Um, at first we thought we might only do half a dozen, but here we are in tier four. Um, just an opportunity for me to invite some of my favorite poets from around the UK and further afield, really relaxed half an hour of chatting and performance. And tonight uh, we have James McDermott joining us. Uh, so James is a poet and playwright based in Norfolk. Um, he was recently shortlisted for Outspoken's uh, Poetry Prize for Performance. Um, he is a very highly acclaimed writer across a range of mediums. So I'm going to join him. Uh, in <sighs> Hello, mate. Hello, can you hear and see me clearly? Um, I can hear you better than, well, I can see you clearly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You look angelic. Oh, good. Okay, I am very angelic, Matt. Thank you very much. It's just Norfolk Wi-Fi is terrible, so I feared we might not have a good connection, so I'm glad we have. Well, I can hear you. The picture is not 100% smooth, but it's, it's, your, it's your wonderful voice that we're, that we're here for. Not that your face isn't wonderful, but as long as we can hear the poetry, it's all right, isn't it? All right. As long as you're fine with it. I don't know whether I can do any better. It's all right. Visually. It? Yeah, it's all right. It's all right. It's honestly, it's fine. It's, it's, it's great. Um, so how are you doing? Do it. I'm good. Thank you. I'm very, very well. Just uh, kind of starting to wind down for Christmas, just eating lots of cheese. <laughs> Essentially, that's all I'm doing. How are you doing? <laughs> well, uh, a week ago I was in tier two. Now I'm in tier four. <laughs> I don't know. I know. It's mad, isn't it? I've heard rumour that Norfolk is tips to go into tier three or four when things change again, because cases yeah. have gone up badly here. Uh, yeah, so it's just relentless. I just think I'm trying to switch off from it now and just trying to get festive and focus on writing, focus on family and Christmas. Otherwise, you'll just be so anxious if you're constantly checking in with it. Yeah, of course. Um, so I've been asking everybody this. Have you, have you been writing much this year? or uh, Not that there's any pressure to, I'm just curious. No, I have. So I found it really difficult to write plays this year uh, because to me they're very optimistic in the sense you assume people are going to come and see them they're going to get on and uh they take so much out of you in the sense about people going on journeys which is what i haven't been able to do in lockdown nor has anyone else but i've found i've written a lot of poetry because they tend to be more introspective and about the past and the present as opposed to the future certainly the stuff i write so it, it felt like a nice way to process everything i was feeling in the present moment and about the past uh and they're just quicker to write kind of in a non theoretical way, just that sense of they're quicker to write, easier to write than a big old play. So I've written a lot of poems, but not a lot of plays. What about you? Have you managed to get a lot of stuff written? Uh, I've been trying to work on a novel that I started like last August, but uh, I've been scrambling around so much because like about 60% of my income before lockdown was traveling around schools. And obviously that all went in the space of a week. So I've been trying to make up the money elsewhere from home. So I've, I've been trying to mate, but it's difficult in it. And I guess what you're saying about writing a play, trying to write a novel, it just feels so overwhelming. I've, yeah, it's, it's just, I'm, I was going to ask you about the relationship for you between play, being a playwright and being a poet. Um, yeah. As, which, one, which one would you say comes first? Like, are you a playwright that writes poems? Are you 50-50 or? Oh, wow. Uh, I think it changes whatever I'm doing the most of at the moment. That's the thing I feel the most like. So I feel more like a poet at the minute because I'm writing more poems and plays. I think fundamentally, I would say I'm a writer of kind of rural queer stuff 
and the prose and the poems are all different from the calls for those stories. I think if I want to write about a journey, I'll write a play. If I want to write about a moment or a memory, I'll write a poem. So I feel like yeah. a writer that does both plays and poems. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's no need to yeah. put labels on you, is there, or pigeonhole you. I was just curious, really. Um, and your collection, Manatomy, was published, uh, it was in lockdown, wasn't it, that it came out? It was, yeah, it came out in August, which feels yeah. millennia ago. Uh, yes, yeah, so we launched it in, we launched it in a lockdown, which is very strange. So all this is very familiar to me, this kind of insta-gig stuff. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you've been crafting this for years, you've been picturing publishing it, and then you publish it in a pandemic. But I guess, like you say, people like Bernie and I in particular have been so innovative with the podcast and the Insta gigs. I guess it's still, it's still, I, I very much am aware of that collection and it's had such great response online. Um, so yeah, uh, it must, it must feel, it must feel great to have it out there. Um, how long had you been writing it? Was it a fairly new thing or? Uh, it does feel great to have it out there. It's still that sense of, I feel like I've read so few of the poems in front of live people, so I don't really know how it lands with people yet. So it's almost like throwing something into the dark and hoping it lands really. But I think in terms of how long I've been writing it, I think it started, the first third of the book started as a solo show that I wrote on my MA at UEA oh. in 2016. And that was going to be a play, but it, uh, I toured a solo show shortly after writing that and had a really lonely experience. And thought, I don't want to do another play. Uh, on my own I'll turn this into a book instead and so I've probably been writing it about three or four years and then Burning Eye said they would publish it in they told me they were going to publish it on April Fool's Day 2019 so I thought it was a joke for days and didn't respond to an email uh, and then they reached out again and said James it's really not a joke uh, yeah so that's the story of it four years in the writing and then two years ago I found out they were going to do it didn't believe them and then accepted it well, what a journey. What a journey. Um, yeah, I was going to ask you again as well, because obviously, like you say, with a poem, quite often, though, it's only when you've performed it, say, even three or four times, that you really get a sense of whether it's finished or what its purpose is. Like a poem, very yes. much uh, only part of its relationship is the point where it goes on stage in it. So but obviously for a play, like once it's on stage, like that's, that's, that's it in it. There's no, maybe I should tweak that bit. So do you feel, is that something that you're conscious of? Or um, does that change the way that you write? Like, do you feel like you have to be, I don't know, sorry, I don't want to put words in your mouth, I'm just curious. No, I think I didn't really fuss about it until publishing. And so a couple of plays got published from 2019 and then obviously with Monatomy. And I thought before that the plays lived, the kind of plays lived in the moment so I could change right up until they went on stage or I could change a poem every night depending on what's gone on in the world or a thought I might have had about it on a journey to a gig. Uh, but since they've been published, I got very angsty about uh, the finality of it and yeah. uh, already wanting to go back and change stuff that's in anatomy and just having to fight that anxiety, just think, have uh, compassion for that younger writing self and think, okay, you're still learning, it's not final and that's okay. I think yeah. my approach, approach with plays is that plays are going to be rewritten every night by the audience. They're going to laugh at different things or walk out at different things. The temperature of the room, the day of the week affects a play yeah, so much, I mean. just as it does a gig. I think if you come out on Friday or Saturday, you want a night out. And so the audience have got a real sense of, uh, please me, if you like. Whereas if you go out Monday to Thursday, you're kind of there for the work yeah. in a way that might be a little more receptive and kind to that work. So, uh, yeah. I also think so much of it has got nothing to do with me once it's out in the world. Uh, yeah. In that kind of relinquishing that fear sense, just my job is to write it and then once it's gone, it's gone and do the next thing. Yeah, fair play. Yeah, it's a very important lesson to learn, I think. Um, well, do you fancy sharing a poem? I absolutely do. So I will do one I haven't done before on an Insta gig, but I, uh, as you said, in the top of the... Uh, introduction, I'm from Norfolk, so I thought I'd read a poem about being in Norfolk. Nice. Uh, so this is a poem called Norfolk Living. Life is never as bright as the lights from the fruity. Time moves as slowly as tractors drive in the country, and the days are as grey as the fish from the chippy. Afternoons are as flat as the hills in this county, and nights as dead as the high street in Wells next to the sea. Bingo. 
is the only place to go to get lucky. The pubs are as empty as second homes in Blakeney, and the only clubs are dominoes, bowls and rummy, and the only cock crowned here crows at 5.30. <laughs> Whilst unlike buses, bigotry comes regularly, and it's only on postcards that Norfolk is sunny, and the only change here is in pots for charity, this silly little county is home, sweet <laughs> home to me. Beautiful. Thank you. Love that. Thank you, Ben. I'm, uh, I'm very guilty of only really knowing Norwich, to be honest. I don't really know much of Norfolk other than Norwich, so but I'm, I'm definitely curious. And it is one of those places that people, uh, because there's no roads, I think, in or out, you've got to come here willingly to find the coast, uh, which I love and hate because it can feel really claustrophobic, but also really yours. Yeah. So I do encourage you to explore it. It's a gorgeous place. When it's safe to explore it, of course, don't bring your COVID here. Don't want it if you're in London. <laughs> <laughs> I promise you I won't. It's all right. Um, That's fine. So, I, so you, I, you must obviously when you write a play, it will tour a lot. Um, like as a poet, have you, you've been gigging around the UK quite a lot, or is being in Norfolk limited that, or how, how have you found that as a poet traveling around? I, I love it really. I think so much of my time is spent trying not to write, which is the case for lots of writers I know as well, and. Uh, filling the diary with gigs would make me feel like I was a writer when I wasn't actually writing. So I would try and get out as much as possible to not write. Uh, so lockdown certainly bred that discipline to kind of really focus on the writing. There's lots going on in Norfolk as well. There's a Norwich Art Centre is a fantastic place for uh, poetry and spoken word events. And Pasco, who runs that and I know has worked with you before, is great at programming spoken word. And there's an event called Toast, which happens or happened every month pre-COVID, uh, yep. where they would have headline poets and support so there's lots of stuff going on but just again to get that work out and to get away from the writing desk i would always want to go and gig elsewhere yeah uh like getting attention and procrastinating at the same time it's a writer's dream it's a dangerous combination it's a heady <laughs> cocktail but adrenaline avoidance and attention yeah but did you so uh did you ever find that say when you first started out you'd write poems that you know people from norwich or norfolk would connect with and then suddenly you find yourself on stage in Manchester and you're like, oh, like, did you ever have that moment? I'm not, I'm not saying that based on you. I'm just curious because yeah. as a writer, I'd write stuff that I knew would go down well in Yorkshire and then I'd do it in London and it'd get a flatter response and I'd be like, oh, and I feel like as a writer, that's a big point. So I'm just curious to see if that was something you'd experienced or. Yeah, I think certainly in Norfolk, there would always be a laughter of recognition about the lives I was writing about, whereas elsewhere there might be a, a laughter of, oh, how sweet. I think that's something that <laughs> happen with poems about, oh, how sweet this rural life is. Yeah. But I think the more I've talked about it with people and the more I've written, the more I tend to think that everyone's got their Norfolk. They've got a little place they feel trapped in or a job they feel trapped in or a relationship they feel trapped in. And it's that bizarre thing as well. Sometimes the more specific you are, the more universal it is. Yeah. Because, uh, if you write about feeling sad, everyone's felt sad, but it's so vague, no one connects with it. If you write about feeling sad in your way, someone says, oh, I feel sad in a really specific way too. You're talking to me. Yeah. And so I found that with Norfolk. The more specific I am about Norfolk and life there, the more people think, oh, he's also writing about Manchester. Or he's also writing about Leeds or whatever it might be. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. I wish I was taking notes. I'm going to watch. <laughs> oh, God, I'm glad I'm going to watch. <laughs> um, that's brilliant. Um, do you fancy sharing another, another poem? I do, yeah. So I will read the poem that uh, Nymphs and Fogs published on their Instagram the other week, uh, which is a poem called The Gym is Like a Gay Bar, which is one of my favourite titles. In it. I think I've stolen it from... It goes like this. The gym is like a gay bar. Men flex muscle to music and want the other men to look and desire their body. The gym is like a sauna. Men meet there. They undress then change, they all work up a sweat, then when spent, shower together. Me and them want the same thing, the perfect male body. But they think that it is wrong to want what I want, and so they invert their desire to turn themselves into what they want, something big and hard that throbs <laughs> with pulsating veins. <laughs> nice, I like that, yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's a great poem. Thank you. Got a good response on uh, on here as well on Instagram. To be fair, 
Yeah, it did. I've loved the sharings that you've been doing uh, since you started those as well. It's just a lovely little window into people's work and uh, has led me to find lots of other poets. Yeah, like I know Insta Poetry gets a lot of stick, but I also do think it's a really lovely way just to, you know, just to get a peek, like you say, just a little snippet. And it's not the same as having to pick up a collection, not that that's a bad thing, but in these crazy times, it's uh, sometimes a bit easier to have a glance in it. Um, and it's just nice to see something on someone on your feed other than a face or food. That's how I always think of it, just kind of popping a little bit of poetry in someone's day as opposed to a picture of your face or your dinner is a far nicer thing to do. Good, thank you. I'm glad you think so. Um, so, the, poet, the poems that you've been writing about during, sorry, the poems that you've been writing in lockdown, do you feel as though mm. you've been writing about things you wouldn't necessarily have written about before? Or do you feel like you've just sort of refocused yeah. on, like, I'm curious to know how that might have impacted. Because, um, for example, like, you know, you think you might think a lot more about who your audience is or the, the purpose that your poem is fulfilled. I mean, everyone's different, obviously, but say like in June when with what happened with uh, the murder of George Floyd, that changed a lot of people's writing. And I don't know, I'm just curious, like, Sorry, I'm waffling rather than letting you answer. <laughs> no, no, no. I think um, I think it's certainly what's gone on has impacted on the writing. I think the Cosmonatomy was written through it was like a book that really looked inwards at my sexuality when I was working stuff out. And as I've got a little bit older, I've looked outwards. And I've said this to lots of people that all my hypervigilance that I'd have as a gay person, that fight or flight where you're looking for threat, uh, all of that had gone in lockdown because there were no people around me anymore. And it all went into Norfolk. So I found a lot of nature poetry and being incredibly present and all that fight and flight and angst and observation about the world. It couldn't go to people anymore. So it went to Norfolk. So I found myself writing a lot of nature poetry through that queer lens. Uh, and the first draft of the second collection in lockdown about that kind of queerness of nature. And, and I think it feeds into what's gone on with lockdown as well, love of the natural and the landscape showing me that everything is transient and whatever we're going through at the minute, things are changing, nature's carrying on regardless. So I think I didn't expect to write nature poetry this year, I would say that. Uh, it always felt like something that felt very heteronormative. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm surprised I ended up doing that. That's fascinating, yeah. I'm really, I'm really interested uh, to see how different people have responded to it. And like you say, like even just on a day-to-day -day basis if you felt like sometimes you immediately on the defensive or uh, and suddenly you're very introverted and yeah no it's, it's um and i know a lot of people have had a bit of a creative head and not been able to write for whatever reason so to, to hear that you've drafted a second collection that's wonderful oh yeah. yes Are you there no i am yeah can you hear me oh, yeah yeah, sorry, I just, I was having the little spinny circle for a little bit then. Um, That's right, as was I, as long as we're back now. Well, I loved what you were saying, um, and I hope everybody else got that about writing about nature and sort of, I guess it's just, what we always love as writers is to move on to the next phase of our creativity, and, and I guess the lockdown, in some ways, sort of like forced us into that. So like you writing in a completely different way, in a way that you wouldn't have done before, I guess that is one silver lining of it all, isn't it, really? Um, I love that. I love that thought that we're looking for that next phase of the career. I haven't thought of it like that. And that sense of, I think, I don't know about you as well, but when you get out gigging and you've got lots of work on, uh, because you're riding that wave, lots of the work can be really similar. And you get your groove and you think, okay, people like that and they keep recommissioning that. And that's an unconscious process sometimes, but you find yourself doing your poem or your play. I remember Andrew McMillan saying so many times that he will write something but get rid of it because it's an Andrew McMillan poem. And he's saying he's always trying to write that next yeah. poem that surprises him so it surprises a reader. And I think, as you say, yeah, lockdown has been a really good time to interrogate why the hell we're doing it and what we want to do it for yeah. when we've all lost jobs and money. Yeah. It's such a risky industry. Why are we there? We've all had to really analyse that and write truthfully in a way that we might not have done before when we were writing just because there was lots of jobs there. Yeah, totally. And and like you were saying as well about you, you were writing a lot about your sexuality because it, it um, say if that was a period of your life when you were 
figuring it out and then you maybe that served its purpose and now you move on to the next phase like obviously sexuality is not something that applies to everybody in terms of the first phase of the writing but you've done you've you've written about that now now you're going to write about the nature and now you'll write about i just i find it fascinating that that's how you've responded and i love that um i sort of wish i'd done yeah. the same but i've just gone well <laughs> um, no i think we'll say this but it's probably all exactly the same just i mean we think we think we're different and then someone else reads it. No one's seen these new poems I've written in lockdown yet. I remember a playwriting mentor saying to me that we've all got a monomyth. We've got one story we rewrite time and time again. And we're all, every, everything we write, we're trying to heal the same wound. And we fail every time because it's writing and it can't heal a wound. Interesting. But we forget that every time. So it's, I think it's different stuff. And I hope it's different stuff because then it will feel like a year really richly spent. But when people come to see it next year or it gets published whenever, people will say, oh, it's the same as Monatomy. So, who well, knows? We'll see. I'm sure it's not. But um, um, would you fancy it, sharing a, another poem or two? It's, oh, it's, it's just gone yeah. time to. So, um, Absolutely. Cool. So, can I, I'll do a few then. So, uh, I thought because one thing I'm really, really missing is a gay scene and I'm missing pubs a lot. So, I thought I'd do a couple of pub uh, and gay scene poems. So, cool. this first one is uh about going out on the gay scene thinking it's going to be your oz if you like you've lived in candace you go and find oz and you think it's going to be this really accepting place but then lots of gay people tell you you're the wrong type of gay because you don't look like this or you walk like this so this is a poem called the wrong type of gay cool i went out on saturday to a nightclub that was gay men in there stopped me to say turn around and go away you are the wrong type of gay you cannot come into play because of how you mince and sway because your manner is too fey because you're such a camp cliche you are the wrong type of gay i'm the wrong type of gay me i am the wrong type of gay i'm a minority me within my minority i am the wrong type of gay then more men joined in to say because you can quote doris day because you love betty and may because you sing songs from broadway you are the wrong type of gay because you don't work out all day because your pecs aren't hard as clay because your clothes are pink not gray because you're wearing a beret you are the wrong type of gay i'm the wrong type of gay me i am the wrong type of gay i thought it would be we g but it's still them and me i am the wrong type of gay thank you <laughs> nice i like that Thank you, Matt. So this one uh, is about uh, leaving that bar in which you're the wrong type of gay and heading out to find a different gay club on the strip, only to find it's been turned into a costa or something similar. So this is about the decline of Soho and the gentrification of those gay spaces. It's called So Long Soho. So Long Soho, you boozy floozy, you pretty, shitty, witty, fitty, you liver of London. You giver of freedom, you sliver of individuality in this drain of chains we call a city. You are withering because suited vultures mad for money are selling off your solace for many to build houses, offices and crap coffee selling orifices for the few and there is nothing we can do. So long Soho. So long to your gay pubs and drag clubs and art hubs where smart cubs dreamt up ways to better our culture. Because suited vultures mad for money are turning your once sacred gay ground into an investor's playground and they're uprooting you and me. Where now do the bohos, hobos and homos who made this home go? Where now do the queers, queens, has-beens and never-beens avoid life's meanness can we not have one place that is ours without you having to build towers on it so so long soho so long nice thank you fantastic yeah it's uh it's tragic in it what's happening to soho i mean i know obviously soho is not unique in but in, in its gentrification but like you say it's the heart and soul of the uh, well, any kind of alternative lifestyle or subculture in it, really. Yeah, and it's just, it feels similar with theatres not being funded properly as well. You think uh, most counterculture 
like Soho or uh, theatre is very anti-Tory. Uh, most people who go there and work in it will be liberal. And so the fact it's being dismissed where so many other things are being supported really vehemently feels like a political choice uh, that they're letting, yeah, letting arts and counterculture perish. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's it's frustrating, but they'll never they'll never stop great art being produced, and they'll never stop artists like yourself from thriving. They'll just maybe make you reinvent, make us reinvent ourselves as artists and writers. And yeah, it's it's grim yeah. now, but there'll be a new Soho at some point. They will, and I think we've all become we've all learnt so many new skills because of it, in the sense of staying in the game and learning new craft, and we've also become really angry and determined. And we're either doing things like this where we're making work more portable and uh, adapting or when we can go out into theatres, we are going to be fuming and we're going to be very, very powerful. Yeah. And um, I think it's a really exciting thing when things change as well. Whenever Edinburgh Fringe happens again, that's going to be some full on experience. Well, I was thinking about that and when bars do open, it's going to be Grecian in yeah. terms of how people respond. It's just going to be so emotional and overwhelming. Yeah. Whenever that might be. <laughs> um, well, it's entirely up to you if you want to do one last poem or not, or if you want to chat, it's whatever you want to do. But either way, I've loved having you on. I'm so glad that you're happy to give up your time. I know you've been doing a lot of teaching the last few months. Um, yes, which is why it's taken me so long to come on. I'm normally on a Tuesday, I would teach for Norwich Theatre Hall, but we wrapped that last week. So thank you for your patience and thank you for asking us to come on tonight. No, of course. Of course. It's been wonderful to. Um, to hear your work and and you sent in a poem for Roaring Twenties Radio as well which was very much appreciated and very well received so yeah I'm uh, I'm excited to see you read these poems in person at some point I love I love going to Norwich Arts Centre it's a bit of a home away from home for me so yeah it's a gorgeous thing. I've seen you there before as well I saw uh, your show but I don't think I came to say hello afterwards so Ooh. I think we that's I was thinking I thought I, I thought I might have chatted to you in the bar afterwards briefly Oh, I see. Okay, maybe we did then. I don't I remember chatting. Right. I, remember quickly, I, was, I, was, I was thinking, I'm sure. Anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, well. It's fine. I've got a very distinct face. So if you have, you'll probably remember me. Yeah. Uh, I think Pasco might have introduced us. Uh, that's probably how it would have happened. But I was thinking, if you want me to, I can close with that poem that I sent into the radio as well. Yes, uh, please. I love that poem so much. You. Thank you very much. So do I. It's one of my favourites to do. It's just such a... Uh, everything I've wanted to say to homophobes is in this poem. So this was, in, this was inspired by my overhearing on a Norfolk bus, an old woman say that all the gay she knows are promiscuous, anxious alcoholics. Uh, and so when I heard her say that, I did what anyone would do in that situation, Matt, and I wrote a poem about it. So this is that poem. Some of us are promiscuous, but you can't blame us. Since birth, you've told us gay men are not monogamous and love cannot exist between us. Plus, some of us just love penis. And want to play and lay with many partners before we say for sure which one stays with us, not because we're homosexual, but because we're homo sapien. And that is usually how humans find who they love. Some of us are big drinkers, but you can't blame us. We're just drowning out your wicked whispers and we can't meet a man in the streets like you can. We can't hold hands in the streets like you can. We run the risk of violence from some caveman. So the only safe spaces we can find connection with people like us. The only safe spaces we can show affection to people like us. The only safe spaces we don't face derision simply for being us are in gay pubs and clubs. And that is why we have to learn to like the liquor. Plus, some of us just love getting plastered and drunk dancing along to the songs of ABBA, not because we're homosexual, but because we're homo sapien. And humans like to get pissed and get their groove on. Some of us are anxious, but you can't blame us. Since birth, you've told us, you covert cultural child abusers, that we are sinners, simply for being us. As top stentines, we spent ages trying to hide telltale queenie gestures, trying to dampen and stamp out our camp voices, because every day strangers were shaming us. Every day strangers were naming us. Every day strangers were claiming us to be monsters. Plus, we aren't anxious because we're homosexual. We're anxious because we're homo sapien. We're all raw, 
unsure and insecure on this rock that's racked with war, wondering what life is for. So yes, some of us are promiscuous, big drinkers and anxious, but you can't blame us. We just behave like this because of how you've shamed us. Thank you. So powerful. So powerful. Thank you so, so much. I, I'm so glad you uh, you gave up your time to share these words. And uh, yeah, I hope to see you, well, fingers crossed next year, but <laughs> at some point. I hope so too. Um, and yeah, I can't wait to hear what these new nature poems sound like. It'll be fascinating. Thank you. So, Burning Eye getting the manuscript in January, I think. So, hopefully, it will see the light of day in about 2022. Cool. Uh, but I'll start start doing them next year at gigs and things. Yeah. And I look forward to seeing what you're going to do next. Well, we'll see. <laughs> cool. All right, mate. Well, take care. Have a great festive period. And uh, yeah, I'll see you soon. Uh, thank you for having me. Look after yourself. You too, mate. Bye. Uh, that was the fantastic James McDermott. Um, so yeah, please uh, check out Manatomy. Uh, James has signed copies on his website, um, but also obviously you can buy them through Burning Eye Books as well. Uh, so please support uh, independent artists. Uh, next week, I'm not entirely sure what's happening yet. I think I'm going to host it and do a few poems myself, and then have one or two guests popping up. It won't quite be the normal format. It should be like an end of year special. Um, but all 27 sessions are available to watch back as well if you need something to watch over the, the next couple of days. So, so yeah, my name is Matt Abbott. Uh, we are Nimson Folks. Thank you for tuning in, and I'll see you soon.